Welcome to Open Stutter. I'm Vivian Siskin. And I'm Sarah McIntyre. And grab a cup of coffee because you're here with Vivian and Sarah, Coffee with Vivian and Sarah, where we're having some random conversations about stuttering, things we like to talk about. Hi, Sarah. How are you today? Hi, Vivian. Uh, uh, I'm good. I'm having like a total fangirl mo moment because your YouTube channel is something that I watch personally a lot and my clients do. And so to have a chance to to chat with you and to just, yeah, hit record, I th th think is really cool. So thanks for having me. Yeah, we've been talking about doing this for a long time. We never had an opportunity and here we are bonding over coffee, right? Let me see your coffee. Totally. This is my coffee. I've actually started making espresso as a hobby and gotten like a little bit serious about like the weighing of everything. And um, so I have too much coffee these days. And so everyone, I might be a little bit wired right now. <laughs> Me too. But I've gone the easy Nespresso route. So I've got my Nespresso. I think it's the uh, sweet vanilla. Yeah, there we it's are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have half decaf because I thought I don't think li li listeners need to see me on um, <laughs> four full caffeinated shots of espresso. <laughs> by day. But they might be right. They might be. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we're kicking this off as our first coffee with Vivian and Sarah. And maybe we should just start about talking about why we like to do this. What do you think? I think that sounds like a good start. Yeah, yeah. So start out, Sarah, what, what do you like about talking about stuttering? Why does it make you happy, bring you joy? Why do we want to even do this? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I, you know, I think obviously from a per, per, per personal standpoint as someone who stutters, talking about stuttering still, you know, to my younger self feels nuts, like the least... To, the the least probable topic of my adult life that I thought I would actually enjoy talking about. So um, a, a part of me is pretty proud of that and surprised. And um, so, I, yes, that immediately comes to mind in terms of personal story and journey. Um, yeah. And then you're one of my favorite people to talk stuttering with and learn from. So when when we got a chance to kind of meld those, I was like, I'm all in. Well, thank you. That's very sweet. I enjoy talking about stuttering with you too. I think it's a good combination. But I think it's really interesting that you mentioned that it was a topic that you would never think that you'd be wanting to talk about when you think about your early life. And isn't that part of the interest in stuttering that it's the elephant in the room for so many people. It's the topic that no parents and kids ever talk about. People say it's not a topic of conversation in my family. Um, it's one of those topics that rarely comes up. And then here now you are as an adult loving talking about it. What a contradiction, right? I think stuttering is a walking contradiction. And I think that that's, that's such... That's both the mystery and the beauty of it in, in, in understanding it and talking about it. I mean, it's not simple. And I think I like puzzles and I like thinking about things that are, are, aren't obvious. And um, I, I think also within the clinician journey and the kind of personal journey, being able to, to, to take it from a, an elephant in the room topic to a welcomed and embraced topic um, and to see the shift and change and the, 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 that that can have for the person and the family, I think is so cool on a number of levels. Yeah. How did you make that shift? That's really interesting because it is such a contradiction. And one of the interesting things about stuttering is that it's pretty much under, buried under the rug for so many people. Was it gradual for you? I'm just curious. Or did you just wake up one day and say, I'm going to be open about talking about this? No way. And also, I was just thinking, I think I'm going to need like four more cups of coffee to get through it. <laughs> but I'll try to keep, I'll keep it to like the one cup of coffee version short here. But I I flashed back in my brain when you first asked me um, a, your, your first question. And I was remembering, I think I was in like sixth grade. 
we had a, you know, one home computer where you're like dial up AOL internet, you're, you're hogging the phone line and um, have limited time. I remember being like supervised on, on, on the computer. And I remember in AOL, like um, it wasn't Google, but we use that as a, as such a term now, but I remember entering like, can't say certain sounds into the search box. And I remember like wanting to conceal that even that that was something that I was searching because it wasn't a topic that was talked about because people didn't, my family didn't know that I was still struggling with this. They just sort of assumed I had navigated through stuttering and was just coping. Um, and so to go from the can't say certain sounds and then seeing the search results. And I remember stuttering came up and I actually remember gravitating more towards like brain injury or like whatever the other search results were. Like there was a stigma even then and I was experiencing it. Um, so fast forward to, I wasn't until my final year of college, like right before I was needing to interview for jobs and get out and be a real full-fledged adult and make my own doctor's appointments and everything that I think it hit me that I needed to do something about the weight that I was carrying. And so it was from age 21 or 22-ish. I can't even remember how old you are in that final year of college, but um, years. And I think it's a continual journey in many ways from being such a deep-seated covert person who stutters to a recovering covert person who you're like having to check yourself like wait a second no 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 this is something I'm okay with remember yeah. um, it, it's it's a journey yeah and for someone who lived a covert profile um did you know you stuttered because so many people say they didn't really attach the label of stuttering onto what they was quote happening to them because it didn't look like what they thought stuttering was. I didn't know because I I didn't had never really met someone else who stuttered. I didn't really know the term. In high school, I knew the term because I you know I got my first laptop. I remember like you when unwrapping Christmas presents it was like you got a Dell, and um, I I just remember getting a little bit savvier about do 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 do, do, do doing my research, and I, I knew at that point, but. Not before that, no. So you had no therapy? I had therapy as a really young kid. Like when you first start stuttering, I I was one of those kids, my mom said that like at two and a half, I was immediately aware. I was throwing tantrums on the kitchen floor because my words were stuck. Like it wasn't this like out to lunch sort of re re response. I knew it. Um, I knew what was going on. And the advice that they got at the time was just ignore it. It, 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 it'll go away. And I did some speech therapy in kindergarten. And I, I remember being called out of class, like many adults who stutter will kind of, uh, you know, reflect on that like trauma of being called out. And I remember being the kid um, who just felt different in some ways in general um, and being called out being like, oh my God, and going to her little room and talking like a turtle and doing all the things. And I remember telling my mom, like, I really don't like this. Like, I, I would prefer to not go. And she was like, okay, that's fine. So really, ultimately, post-kindergarten, nothing. Interesting, really interesting that you um, found your own stuttering self-help self -help journey later on. Um, so when you were, when you were beginning to discover um, therapy and change and beginning to go through those changes again when you were in toward the end of college. Um, were you experiencing some of those paradoxes yourself? Because when we were talking, you know, one time I forgot when we were talking, Sarah, we were talking about how we were so interested in the paradoxes of stuttering. Did you feel those paradoxes? Did you experience them? Did you know that they were there as part of the experience of stuttering? I did, but might not have had a descriptive term to understand it because I just remember the my world kept feeling like it was getting smaller and smaller then because the pressure to do all the things as you're a senior in college is. And I w w w was a finance major and 
there was interviews coming from different investment banks and consulting firms. And like, I just felt like more and more and more and more. And the more that weight was on me, the more it was on my mind, the more kind of sophisticated I needed to get my, my masking concealment tricks down pat and the less they were working. Um, and I, resorted to to staying in my room a lot um senior year to hiding in the library to to maybe just not being my full self when I could kind of seek that reprieve because it was it was so taxing to be on and 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 my 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 the things I relied on like my cr 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 crutches and tricks like just felt like they weren't weren't were doing their 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 jobs like they they w once were so yes um the more I resisted the more it persisted yeah I don't I don't think I've ever asked you this but did you hit a rock bottom moment like so many people do when they begin a journey of change yeah I did um wow. I remember being in my apartment senior year in college um and I remember experiencing like really significant anxiety. I, I, I don't, I don't want, want to, to minimize someone's experiences having like a true panic attack, but I had what I would describe as just this meltdown moment where I was trying to decide what to do, whether I was going to stay an additional year at college, um, into, to per, per, pursue one of their one-year master's programs I was contemplating mo moving back to Africa, which I had spent a semester um, there, and I was potentially going to teach English for a year. Um, I, I the and I couldn't decide what I really wanted to do and what stuttering was 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 directing in what I wanted to do, and it was that moment in my room. And I can still see it. I can still see the TV with like the VHS and the DVD player built in. Um, I know anyone Gen, Gen Z listening is like, what? <laughs> um, but that that was my moment. And then I, I gave myself a deadline to open up to my parents and they had come up to campus for most of my ho ho home lacrosse games. And so one of those games that when they were about to drop me off, I was like, okay, I have to open up about this. Um, and so that was, that was my bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. How was that experienced for you opening up to your parents? I know that it could be, it could be a range of emotions from relief to shame, to guilt, all kinds of stuff. I think it was a mix of all of those. I think I, I also didn't want them to feel bad that I had been going through this by myself and not shared that with them because we were we are that we are very close mm -hmm. um, and so I think a lot of it was I didn't want them to feel like they should have done something or that I, I kind of knew already then that I didn't want them to carry that that weight but I was scared too because I didn't know I don't know I think there's a little bit of a stigma sometimes about therapy in general and I I had never been to therapy. Um, of course, I could have benefited from it, benefited from it in a number of ways. But um, so I think some mixture of of worry, um, a good bit of shame, because I didn't know if this was something I should have been able to to deal with on my own or not. Yeah, yeah. So at that point, you started learning more about stuttering, and here you are as fabulous therapist. You know, when I think back of when I first started started learning about stuttering, I obviously was um, Joe Sheehan's student and I learned about stuttering from his perspective, the approach avoidance conflict. I was completely riveted to my chair, listening to him talk about stuttering. I had no knowledge about it at all. I was an undergraduate and just in a psychology class, not knowing that I was going to really be learning about stuttering. It turns out that it was all about stuttering, but I didn't know it. Um, <clears throat> and then just, I think for me, it was the idea that the more somebody tries not to stutter, the more they do. And I'm just curious about, I mean, to me, that's one of the most important 
interesting things for me. If somebody said, what's interesting about stuttering? I, those paradoxes, again, I keep on going back to them, <clears throat> which I think makes stuttering one of the most interesting differences to work with as a speech language therapist for me. Um, what what holds you to, to, to this kind of therapy on working with people who stutter? Um, is it learning about their stories? I mean, that's really interesting to me too. Or is it just the idea that it's it just isn't what it seems to other people? That's a big one for me too. Like people think, oh, it's about disfluencies. It's about blocks and repetitions and prolongations. And it's really not about that at all. It's really about, from my perspective, that social self-presentation. What's, what's it for you? Yeah, I mean, all the things like that, that you said too, but I think the, the idea that it touches and impacts the most important things in people's lives, like the most important decisions they might make, what they do professionally, the relationships they pursue personally, how they view themselves, um, what their interests are, whether they actually pursue those interests or not. And so I think the, I think, I think the stories, but also the journey and just being along for the ride and seeing some of those shifts and, and actualizing what it is someone really wants to do and be in life. But from like a stuttering nerd perspective, which I, I'm, I'm like a self-professed stuttering nerd, um, I, think, I think the paradox is the, 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 the deeper root that um, Sheehan and your work and arts has helped me to think through more deeply the conflicts um, and, and, and sort of a frustration in my own journey, I think, through trying to make some surface level changes. And also, on, also feeling like there was more to this just like inherent variability piece that I was told about, that, that there's more there because there is some patterns. And I, I, I just love thinking about my own journey, but then also, yeah, some of those deeper, deeper paradoxical pieces of stuttering. That's what really gets me. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's the suppression piece. So that quote from Sheehan, the successful suppression of stuttering is what maintains and perpetuates it. I thought about that for a really long time. I actually sat with that for a real successful suppression maintains something. Wow. Um, it, it really, it, it really pointed out to me that um, my clients, the people that I would work with, um, that would be a foreign idea to them because they spent every day, like you say, every day, every minute, um, their life is sort of lived through this filter of stuttering, sort of pervading all aspects of their decision-making, um, uh, their, their choices for careers, their choices to um, order something in a restaurant, their choices um, in friends and then um, to show up or not, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, all to suppress stuttering. Mm. And yet that is maintaining it. To me, that kind of blows my mind. I ju it just really does. Yeah. And, the, and the instinctual nature of wanting to control something and how paradoxical that is, uh, you know, to maintain or to our attempts at suppression or our attempts at control and the concept of letting go of control. I mean, I... I have, I always seek control. I think that's just an inherent, whether it was related to stuttering or not, um, or just that is just me. And then my, how I chose to dealt with stuttering then made sense. But that concept what really blew my mind in getting to know my, my mechanisms of trying to, to suppress and control and kind of play that whack-a-mole game or like keep that beach ball underwater as best as I can. And sometimes it's like, but an yeah, yeah. The yeah. Beach underwater. That's really popping up. Yeah. 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 I don't know though that I've ever asked you, like, I mean, it's obvious. I think if one stutters and then they get into the field, you know, the, we you know, but what, what, 
what initially piqued your interest and passion in this and then sustained it? Because as someone who doesn't stutter, that's, that's impressive to me. Yeah. And I have to be honest and say that I'm still really passionate and interest after, interested after, I hate to say like about a half a century <laughs> that old. Um, I do believe that it's something to do with this whole notion of the idea that it's so simple, but it's so complicated. Um, and there's, there's, you know, what, when you sort of practice for a number of years in any field, you sort of become an expert in whatever, let's say, you know, you're a teacher, you're an accountant, or you're an engineer, you know, you become an expert in what you know, and some of it can become routine unless you continue to grow and create. Um, but for me, um, the notion that it's so simple being, from my perspective, the simpleness is that um, it's all about, um, it's all about concealment, and fear or shame. I guess it's, I would look at it this way, either you conceal or you feel shame. So that duality of concealment or shame, concealment or shame, that it has so little to do with the disfluency that comes out of one person's mouth. I mean, to me, that is the, the main thing that is so interesting to me, that it's so simple. But when you meet people who stutter and they're on begin their journey of change, it never occurs to them. They're focused on the um, a couple of other things. They're, they're focused on certainly um, the form the stuttering takes, whether it's struggled or not, and how it appears to others and what others might be thinking. And also they're focused on the mental gymnastics inside their head which go on all day long. And that's certainly a big part of the stuttering um, experience. But when you can boil it down to something so simple as do what you fear, I mean, I want to make it so like, yeah, everybody, it's really easy, but it is very simple, but so hard. If I can, again, quote my associate, Nick Brow, who, when he first learned about this therapy, it's the first thing he said was, Vivian, this is so incredibly simple, but it's so hard to do. And the, when he looked at me and he said that, I said, I, that's it. That's why this is so interesting to me. And if somebody who's a speech therapist can come to that conclusion, imagine other people on their journey. And I have to also say that um, for me, more in recent years, um, working with parents near onset, has been a real joy. Um, and certainly you're getting parents at the time that they're most vulnerable, they're, they're most worried about their child and they really want the stuttering to be fixed and stop, even though they that's really what they want. As they start learning about what stuttering is, it just opens them up to this positivity about stuttering and how their child can be okay and stutter. I, I don't know. I just, to me, that, that every time I experience that with a family, it just makes me want to do it another day. Mm. I know it sounds corny, but you just. Oh, it's very true. <laughs> it's true. I, there's, I don't think there's a lot of other fields that get an opportunity, I think, to, to like, hear about people's lives and and the interwebbing and connection of stuttering and the worries and projection at that young onset age um and get a chance to to be a part of that and to help support that shift it's so true yeah and what about the notion that and i'm sure you've heard this a lot from your clients too sarah um that the ideas in stuttering affirming therapy, the ideas that we do, what we work with every day are so applicable to other problems in life, other differences, other challenges, that people can be applying these concepts everywhere. Just this morning, I was talking with a client and we're just talking about the notion of control. And yeah, I want to control. It's important to control. I have to control. 
everybody wants their control and, and it's not just stuttering people in life you know you want to control what other people are thinking you want to control how your day is going you want to control an outcome of something um and then i was just bringing up the idea what if you can switch that notion of control as being the solution um for the day-to-day -day challenges to problem solving mm -hmm. and it was something that i never thought about even myself but i i just was talking to a client today and a new idea came up and looking at can you switch those out the idea of control for problem solving and maybe have more resilience and 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 flexibility in your life mm -hmm. um so if you can come up with a new idea <clears throat> Just in a morning with a client that you see all the time, I, I don't know if that would happen with other kinds of differences or disorders. I don't know. I don't know. I know we love what we do, but I would we wouldn't go back and decide to specialize in another area. But aren't they jealous of us? <laughs> you must be. <laughs> Although sometimes when I feel like I've hit a wall or I feel, you know, I think like, oh, I envy something that's a little bit more straightforward because like Nick said, it is straightforward or simple, but it is so hard at the same time. Yeah. And I can picture his face when he's saying it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. Yeah, surprise. It's so yeah. simple, but so hard. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. When you said problem solving there. It's like almost by shifting that language, you're giving yourself permission to make, to, to take a risk or to, to potentially make a wrong choice and, and to be wrong or to, to, to make that a part of the process. And I think this, this inherent deep-seated worry about what other people are going to think leads you to be more risk averse as just people. And I think about my own life, um, you know, clinically, I try not to bring it back to myself, as, you know, because everybody's journey is different, but right now I can bring it back to myself. And, <laughs> you know, I would say that I have to actively enact a more risk tolerant or risk approaching kind of mindset because I I tend to want to just do the safe thing or the routine thing. And I think it is just this conditioned response too for not wanting to even take the potential risk that somebody might think a certain thing about me that I don't want to experience. And then when you say that out loud, you're like, gosh, who cares? Come on. Like there's a lot of a, a lot of value in doing that but that's just like a inter thought that comes to mind yeah but it makes so much sense because if you take it out of the stuttering context don't we do that all day anyway don't we function in a way so that we're trying to influence what other people are thinking about us you know we're we we thank people for things we um apologize for things we uh, consider other people's choices and preferences. Um, you don't want to make waves. You don't want to confront people. You know, so much of what we do anyway in life is about trying to control what other people think. So if you add the layer of stuttering on, which happens every time the person starts a conversation, when you already are programmed from early on through stigma and self-stigma to think that stuttering is going to bring a negative thought. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's going to impact. Of course, you're gonna to wanna to control what that is. Um, and I think when I think about control now, I think so much of the effort in control and how much effort that puts into your body and your mind and how much that effort comes out in the pattern, you know, in other words, the stuttering pattern and how much that comes out in tension, because where does all that effort go? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that tension is one of the, from my perspective, one of the biggest challenges that clients and speech therapists 
work on together that, you know, you can get rid of a lot of behaviors that are interfering with forward moving speech. But what about that tension? Mm -hmm. Is that tension related to that control? Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Yeah, for sure. It's the product. It's it's the summation. I'm, my former self was a math nerd. So, so I like to think in, in, in that way, but yeah, it's the sum total of all the things, you know, we're doing the most and we were doing the most to out of self-preservation, you know, we're, we're just trying to keep ourselves state safe. So in response to trying to suppress something that we, we don't want to expose because we are going to be perceived a certain way, we, we have layered on the most and, and that struggle, um, I think can be really misinterpreted in an overly simplistic, um, you know, you talk about like the, it happening to me or this language of responsibility. And I think that always, that really changed my perspective in understanding it um, so, so much. Yeah. The contributions of Wendell Johnson and Dean Williams in terms of the language of doing has really influenced how I think about stuttering um, because I think that it does feel like for kids and adults, it feels like it is happening. And we, you know, when you're working on maybe getting sound in a block or the idea of deciding to open stutter, it really feels like you can't. Mm -hmm. That's true. That I'm, I can't. I'm still working on getting sound on the block. <laughs> can't I just can't and you know one of my clients is the one who actually said to me um Vivian I think that it's not that I can't because he would say all the time Vivian I know I but I can't I can't get any sound in and one day he just came to group and he said it's not that I can't it's I'm unwilling mm -hmm. and when you come to that recognition that you're unwilling because of the risk that you talked about, Sarah, you know, what are you risking? You're risking a lot and you have to be ready to do that. And I think that therapeutically is an, a really important concept um, when clinicians are having um, challenges helping their clients reach open stuttering. If their clients want to reach it, they have to understand that difference that it really truly feels like they can't. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say the time elapse and the process of simmering on it and all the things that contribute to readiness, like that that tipping over, like, okay, I'm not ready, but like I could tolerate it. Th that is such a cool process to 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 just be a fly on the wall for and to and to support. But the the meat of it really, it's like all the actual doing of taking that risk and and being willing to tolerate or being willing to to expose or to surface the beach ball it, that's later i think it's the let me let me understand why i would want to do this which seems completely backwards as to why i walked in your door <laughs> i'm still laughing at your beach ball analogy i love it right? because it's true a beach ball you know try to keep the beach ball underneath you know it takes a lot of control right I love analogies too. You're you're the queen of analogies, probably way better than mine. Because mine always center around sports or math or you know things I like to do. But the beach ball, it's like you can go a lot of directions with it. <laughs> the further down you're trying to 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 hold it, the further down you're trying to stuff stuttering. Um, yeah, it's harder. Yeah. And then the idea that when it become when it surfaces, it could be light as a feather. Yeah. So both or chewed up and yeah, because <laughs> a lot of times when we're first exposing, like it is ugly, um, mm -hmm. and then you're like, nope, no, thank you. <laughs> Go back to. <laughs> I'm just gonna hold it down here for a little. Hold it down for a little longer, uh, yeah. <laughs> or halfway, and you know, let it bounce around a little with it a little bit, yeah. um, and. You know, whenever I picture that beach ball, like holding it down, I picture like even the stuttering pattern of, you know, you will, you want to open stutter, but you're holding back. You want to open stutter, but you're holding back. 
you know, that's why this therapy is so much fun because, um, you know, you can develop analogies with your clients that are, that are actually funny, you know, and vivid, right? You said something this past summer at, at the arts training. What was it the summer? I think it was April. Yeah. April, summer, yeah. not the summer. So a year ago, you used the term um, stutter dangerously. Um, and it just made me think of it, what you just said there. Yeah. 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 And it is dangerous when you think about how many years, decades for some people that showing stuttering is in the danger zone. That's something you don't want to do at all costs. And now here we are stepping into that danger zone. Yeah. And in that moment that you just modeled, uh, 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 you know, the safety zone or the routine or what we're accustomed to is that. It's, the, it's what comes next that feels like there is this threshold doorway that like the door is shut and it, it, it is not an option. And like opening that door and like hurling yourself through, it's not going to be like a pretty step, but you could be just like throwing your body in. When you said stutter dangerously, like that's the danger zone where like that door feels shut, but like, what do you have to lose? And you're going to have to hurl yourself in. Yeah, yeah. Stutter with abandon is one of my favorite ones too. Yeah. And I think that for so many people, you know, even if you compare the struggle of reactivity to open stuttering versus struggle with control, even if even if the struggle with control is more struggled than what the open stuttering would have would look like, people prefer their old patterns. Um, they know what that's like. It's predictable. And that's the control piece. If I stay here long enough, the fear is going to die down and I'll be able to say the word. And even though I'm escaping and I'm struggling and I'm tense, it's me. I know it. I'm familiar with it. It's comforting. It's the way I stutter. And change is really hard. Change is really hard. Even if, because going into that, like you say, going into that abyss where you don't know what's going to happen. What if I never release it? What if it goes on forever? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the fear of not knowing what's going to happen. That loss of control, because so much of the pattern, I think for people struggled or otherwise is very much controlled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's defined by the box that we've defined as being the acceptable or tolerable. I wouldn't even say acceptable, but what we're what what, what we can handle. Yeah. Um, but then it becomes so out of body, out of mind feeling. Like it feels like that's it. It really does feel that way. And then to enact change and to hurl yourself over, you have to do it enough times to then even think, oh, wait a second. I do feel like I could see myself kind of dialing back um, by not trying to dial back, which is the whole backwardsness is that I really love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, those first steps are really beautiful when you see somebody beginning them, you know, like stepping out of their comfort zone for the first time and allowing themselves to show some stuttering in a different way than they, and then they've shown it. Um, and just being willing to risk doing something different is the beginning, I think, of that journey to change the way you stutter. It's all about risk. Yeah. And then watching you celebrate that, which feels like so uncomfortable, right? And they're like, who is this woman? <laughs> <laughs> but imagine you know Sarah that you bring that up imagine if parents celebrated that for the kids can you imagine I'm getting kind of emotional just even thinking about it just imagine if kids could stutter the way they do and parents could celebrate their communication and celebrate their authenticity and their openness um, maybe they would never struggle I don't know you know it, 
it's, you, it's hard to go back and figure it out. And it's, is it all parents, you know, the kids themselves are deciding on their own, this is not acceptable, so to speak. Um, but to celebrate authentic open stuttering is such a rare thing anywhere. Absolutely. And it is still one of the acceptable things to be unacceptable of or unaccepting of, right? And so it makes total sense when people are like, oh, that sounds backwards. But I do think about like in hypothetical theory land, what if stuttering wasn't something that was seen as not good, like sorted over in this hat or responded to like what would the experience be like and how would that be different yeah it reminds me I love this topic it may be a whole new topic but it reminds me of um the final question that Nan Ratner and I used to give in the stuttering course at Maryland where um we had this you know you're on the island of Repranov which Repranov is Van Riper backwards by the way um so you're you're on the island of Repranov, and on this island, everybody values stuttering, and it's considered to be um, um, uh, a trait that people seek to be a person who stutters. And if you don't stutter, um, it's not you know you're not as you know you you're not in that social status. So um, the question we pose to the students is. What is therapy going to look like in Repranov? Hmm. And we've gotten some really interesting responses. Um, everything from genetic therapy to getting people to stutter um, to um, um, uh, sort of um, negative responses to fluency, and you know, which would sound typical. But it's interesting that, and you're probably already figuring this out because the bottom line is that if stuttering were valued, you couldn't create it. Mm -hmm. You would have disfluency without struggle. And so it, it would, Repranov would, um, the stuttering would die out on Repranov. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. <laughs> No. And, and, and to think like you can know all of this and still be in the, the space of, I mean, lots of gains and lots of growth to, to what I would say is my good enough place for the most part. No. But to think that there's still that self, pre the presentation of self conflict at times, right? And you know better and you know you know, all the things, but you're, you're human yeah. and you have grown accustomed for so long to thinking a certain way. Um, it's just really, that's interesting. Yeah. And to add one more point to what you're saying, not only growing up thinking a certain way and having the value of a good day is fluent and a bad day is stuttered because that's the way you, you grow up good day, bad day. Um, to be reminded um, when it, in various times during the day that there's some truth to that. Mm -hmm. Negative reactions from others, um, you know, um, sort of um, insensitive comments from relatives, mm -hmm. um, those microaggressions that people talk about that sort of like hit you like, boom, you know, that didn't feel good. Um, so that one, you know, even if you've gone somewhere on your journey and you've valued openness and being able to show yourself as a person who stutters authentically, one little remark like that can bring you back, right? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And I've named that response that, you know, 99% of the responses are there ah, uh, ah, uh, acclimation look where they weren't expecting to meet someone who stutters or sees stuttering or hear it. And that's just them wearing their reaction on their face, like I do about a lot of things. So I can't fault them. 
but <laughs> non stuttering, of course, but, um, <laughs> you know, you can, you, I can label it and say, yep, there's the acclimation look. It's not deep. It's not getting inside to, to, to where it would impact my sense of self, but it still triggers the memories and the associations. Um, and yeah. Yeah. And that's those triggering those memories and the associations is so much of what our clients are working through on a daily basis. You're like so many working parts, so many moving parts. Totally. Yeah. You know, not to bring it back to math. I'm so sorry to anyone. <laughs> that's oh, oh, ahead. Yeah. But, and you, this is, you know, something that you've said. So I might be using some of your language or making it some of my math equation on here, but like we have had an N of a ton. So a sample size of so many things or situations that we have experienced, reacted to, felt, and then filed, right? And to think about the required sample size to disprove or discredit, um, it's pretty vast. And so it, it would be make sense and be okay that that would take time to, to rectify on top of the fact that they, we would still be challenged. It's like, oh, here's, here's a situation who's, that's, that's trying to get back into this sample, but I, I got to put it over here. Um, yeah. 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 So do you think Sarah, that is, I'm beginning to think as you were giving that sort of math analogy there, that you can't wait for that balance to, you can't wait for that balance to happen. The person who is on a path of change has to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I'm, a lot of thoughts are going through my head right now. A lot of my clients ask me, what is it do you think that some people move through this journey quickly and others are stuck for a long time, you know, because it is quite a journey. Is it related to that idea that I'm going to think that way and feel that way and I'm going to have those experiences, but I'm going to do it anyway? Or are they in an environment where those things are changing, where they're, they are experiencing more positive responses? They are experiencing fewer looks, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I think sometimes it's, the determination that um, I'm going to do this, even though that sometimes it doesn't feel like the people around me are on the same page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that determination is a necessary ingredient or factor in the change process. You might need to get a couple, oh, that wasn't bad, or, or oh, that didn't turn out how I assumed it might. But at a certain point, you're going to be challenged with what you have sorted into the not so great pile of response, whether it's externally or internally. And you're going to have to build up this, I, I got to do this. Um, I, yeah, that factor is necessary. Yeah. What was it for you? I mean, can you boil it down to... Um, Either an attitude that you adopted or um, something that somebody said to you or something that you discovered on your own that allowed you to move forward despite those things being filed in the other direction. <laughs> I think initially I needed to observe that other people who I thought were doing the things and living the things that I sorted as not possible for myself to then give me the, okay, like I have to adopt a sort of fake it till I make it or a doing while feeling this way sort of dichotomy. And I know you've talked about that where it's not going to feel good and we can't wait for it to feel good. 
but changing the action component and experiencing something different and giving it a go. Um, you know, chances are it's not going to 100% end up in the way that we assume that it might. And even if it's 50%, which I think is an overstatement anyway, still, we're, we're, we're opening our eyes to what might be possible. But I remember the first experience that I observed that was like, okay, wait a second, I could do this. I was on the elevator up to the, 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 the therapy and I was in the, ele, you know, crowded elevator. We were going to the top floor and someone answered their phone uh, or called someone. I can't remember it. My, my friend Roisin, who um, we started this journey at the same time. And she was, I didn't know her yet. But she answers her phone in the elevator and she's like, hey, 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 yeah. Oh, you know, I lo 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 locked myself out of the apartment. Uh, yeah, such a bummer. Like, uh, uh, I'll have to s s s swing by and pick up the key from you at, uh, after therapy. And she's like talking on the phone willingly. Check. Never. In front of other people. Ooh, definitely never like actually enjoyed the conversation it seemed like for them from an external standpoint check never and like stuttered openly like it was no, there was no guessing from people in the elevator like this person stutters when they communicate and I remember peeling myself tighter against the elevator wall because I was really uncomfortable <laughs> but also intrigued and I was like wait a second because I didn't know yet what to expect of this journey. I was recording myself saying hello on my laptop so that when my phone rang, I could hit play and hold it up like where we were there. So then to see this, I was like, okay, this might be possible. So I think that always stands out as that one of the big, one of the big things that made me think, all right, this might be doable. Wow. It just brings up the whole notion of the value of mentorship, community, watching other people change, group therapy journey, all of those wonderful things. So I'm thinking, Sarah, maybe we could take a pause right now, take a last sip of coffee and like continue with one of those topics the next time. What do you think? Yeah. I like it. As long as you're inviting me back. I mean, no, we're going to have coffee together often because we're going to uh, also, you have to like teach me how to make coffee, right? Maybe, not just like with my Nespresso machine. Maybe we'll start a coffee chat while I will give an instruction to Toronto. No, I'm kidding. I won't bore people because I am like weighing the grams and, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, definitely can. Sounds like a really good plan. It sounds good. Thank you again for, for chatting and, and having me on. It was so much fun. It's always fun chatting with you. Till next time, Sarah. Till next time. Bye.